Welcome to the Straight Pointers Podcast, where seemingly ordinary people join us for extraordinary discussions. You're listening to Season 2, Episode 7 of the Straight Pointers Podcast. This episode was recorded on February 29th, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Lullis. Please visit straypointers.com for more information about the show, including the show notes for this episode. Joining us tonight is computer science professor and pioneer of both electronic bulletin board systems and the World Wide Web, Mr. Bob Fulkerson. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jim. Hey, I wanted to chat with you. Uh, we're doing this kind of out of chronological order, which is fine. But I had met with Dan Kenny on the show uh, almost three months ago to the day to talk about the Endless Forest BBS, which is this uh, electronic bulletin board family of bulletin board systems that lived in the Omaha area during the mid 80s through the late 90s, I believe. Yeah, uh, you were you were the the uh overseer of an incarnation of the endless forest at one time were you not i was um i'm trying to remember exactly when i so i listened to dan's episode um and that kind of spurred me on it's like oh i forgot all about all of those things it was it was fantastic um but yeah there was a time when uh the forest moved from uh dial up to being hosted at UNO, Dan had found somebody who had a, a machine and was willing to, it was a research machine and uh, who was willing to give, uh, give him some space. And I think at the time he took over or was still uh, the sysop, but at some point he asked for somebody else to, to step up because he had other commitments and, so while it was living at UNO, I stepped up and, and became the SysOp and did most of the administrative stuff. Okay. Okay. So before we, before we get into that era, let's talk about your early years. What were some of the first uh, computing systems that you used? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking back on that because I figured you'd ask that question. Um, and my first computer was a VIC-20 that my dad brought home. Um, he was with the Paralyzed Vets, and uh, they got like four VIC-20s for some reason. And he brought one home, and that was my first introduction. So it was probably 81, 1981. And, and by how old were you at the time? I would have been 10. So, um, and then... Uh, messed around with that a little bit. A friend of mine had a VIC-20, so he had been showing me, oh, you can play this game and that game. You can load it off tape. I'm like, ooh, wow, this is really cool stuff. And he had, uh, we had a modem for the VIC-20 and started dialing into uh, CompuServe when it was incredibly expensive to do so. Sure. And uh, so that was my first exposure. And then I saved up, well, essentially my allowance. So my parents' money, uh, I saved up about half of the cost of a Commodore 64, probably in 83 or 84 and, and kind of upgraded to that. So, so when was your first foray onto the bulletin board system scene? Um, so there were the, the, I didn't know what I was getting into when I dial up to CompuServe. None of it made sense. Uh, but I would say my first real forays into the Omaha scene were probably 83 or 84. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I remember systems like uh, Magic Dumpster, mm -hmm. Sanctuary, Milo's mm -hmm. Meadow. Yep. Uh, I believe there was the Round Table. That was the same. Milo's Meadow. Yeah. It, it became the Round Table. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the Endless Forest, obviously. Uh, and there were a couple of others, and I was really trying to think of those others. Um, but yeah, I don't yeah. know. If, I don't know if you ever crossed paths with uh, Kent Smotherman. Yep, absolutely. He was yep. the sysop of 
Milo's Meadow and the Round Table. And he actually wrote wrote the software himself too. Yeah. No, uh I remember meeting him uh because I became friends with um his sister in law, if I'm doing the relationships correctly. Um and so New Kent, uh before professional, uh, back in the back in the eighties. So um yeah, it was it was a crazy time to be a teenager <laughs> making friends um at other high schools, right? I mean, my mm-hmm. core group of friends ultimately heading into high school were from about seven different high schools um at the time, which was was crazy to me. So yeah, it's it's probably more normal now to meet people online, but uh I had the same thing. I was I was in I was in tech school, I was in junior college and there were people coming over to my folks's house that I had never met before. So <laughs> right. That, that was always very interesting. So how did yeah. you hear about your first bulletin board system? Gosh, that is a great question that I don't think I have an answer to. Um, I would imagine that it probably was something with CompuServe that, you know, maybe some local uh, group that was like, Hey, if you live in Omaha, here's some bulletin boards. Um, that's the one question I can't give you a definitive answer to. Okay. Um, fair enough. But um, obviously got into the scene because um, my first user party um, was, was my introduction to all of these people I'd been meeting virtually. So mm-hmm. it was, you know, I was 14, I think, and um, was blown away that all the people on the other sides of these names were my age and 19 and 30 <laughs> and it it yeah you know, the first one at, at godfathers at 77 the pacific that i went to um it, it literally just blew my mind that all these people were all these different people it's so cool so you ran some bbs's uh when you were a teen but they were probably not public bbs's correct that would be correct. Um, my dad was of the mind that I was spending all these this time with people that uh, I could be spending my time with with better people, or I could be spending my time with uh, quote unquote real people. Um, so I had a teen line, and at night, in it was probably I think I was thinking back on it eighty six eighty seven. Um, I ran all night with Jimmy Bond because I was James Bond back in the day. And I actually, I found the discs. Um, <laughs> I went and found my Commodore 64 and it says in really terrible handwriting, current BBS program, 300 baud this side, 1200 baud other. <laughs> I, I don't remember there needing to be two versions of the bulletin board system for different bods, <laughs> but okay. Um, but yeah, I, I downloaded some software, uh, some source code, and I don't remember what the brand was, so to speak, Mm -hmm. but I, my family and I took a cross country trip to Seattle and I printed out the bulletin board, the code, and I spent the drive to Seattle trying to figure out what the code did and trying to block it off and and trying to figure out this code posts to a message board, this code, you know, reads the messages. This is the email section and made all sorts of comments and then took the basics of, uh, because I didn't understand uh, interfacing with the modem. So I just kind of lifted that code. And then I don't want to say I wrote a bulletin board from scratch, but I, I overhauled that code and then ran all night with Jimmy Bond from about 10 p.m. until about 6 a.m. Um, out of my house, yeah, off my teen line, so that my parents wouldn't know that I was doing that. It was, I felt subversive, and <laughs> <laughs> as subversive as a as a you know 15, 16 year old computer nerd can be, and uh, it wasn't until, I mean, I'd been over to people's houses and seen them running their boards, but until I had the power of sitting there and watching people do stuff, it's like, oh, the sysop just gets to watch anything anybody does. Cool. And 
do people know this? <laughs> now, how many users did you have on this board? Um, gosh, that's a great question. Uh, it was all my core friends and a handful of others. So probably, I'm going to say somewhere between 15, 20, 25 oh, okay. folks that would, would call in on a as regular basis as you can for an eight hour period overnight when you can mm-hmm. only have one person on at a time. So did you have file transfer? I did not. I didn't, I didn't go in that direction. I just went with, Hey, let's just have some message boards and, and, uh, and do that. So. Okay. Now, did this ever evolve into something different? Um, I did. Uh, I, I morphed into run when I got a Mac uh, plus, I ran a board off of my Mac plus I didn't write the software for that. That was more just, I picked something and, and, and ran it. Um, but beyond that, no, I didn't morph it into anything else. So when did your, when did your, um, adventures in BBSing sort of wane or did it ever? Oh, it never waned. Um, so I was running my board and visiting all the boards, uh, you know, that I could. And um, then some of my friends were going to UNO Mm -hmm. and they, I don't want to say hijacked an account on a VAX system, but we cobbled together a basic bulletin board system running on an account that you would log into uh, there. Was this in DCL? Yes, I think so. If I remember correctly, I was I was kind of the sit back guy because they they were college kids, they were mm-hmm. college guys, and they knew all the stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, so I, I remember getting on to a UNO DCL uh, system in the in the uh, mid eighties or so, and it it didn't stay up long. No, no, because yeah, if I remember correctly, we were we were trying to run uh, below the radar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um. And then mostly was a user. So running my board lasted, the board, two boards lasted for a couple of years. And then um, took a couple of years when I went off to college and was just a user. And then that's when, when Dan kind of stepped in and said, Hey, you know, I need somebody to run, run the endless forest. And would you like to do that? Now, had you been on the previous, the, earliest incarnation of the endless forest i had been um and it was no disrespect even to my own board but it was probably it had the creme de la creme of um writers uh so to speak uh the creativity level on those message boards uh with the ongoing ever-evolving storyboards Mm-hmm. Uh, that people would write. Uh, there's Vic Wars, Morpo Wars, Baud Wars, a lot of wars uh, that we wrote about <laughs> in the 80s. Um, but the poetry board, the philosophy board, they were all very well populated. And I was was fascinated by those folks and engaged as best I could uh, with them. And uh, I also remember playing Proving Grounds uh, games on the endless forest. I don't remember much about what happened with proving grounds, but I recall playing proving grounds and being like, I got to log in and I got to battle X or Y or Z. So, okay. So, um, when you were asked to take over, when Dan asked you to take over his incarnation of, of the forest, what did that entail? For the most part, um, he was very um, obviously technically savvy to um, con- a to rewrite the original forest code from writ works to CPU works, and to transfer it to a di- different operating system to uh, sit it on a port, listening on a port, and doing TCP port connections. Um, so he was very locked down on the code. I never saw the code. <laughs> um, so it was mostly management type stuff. He was just, I think he had a lot going on and would just, just wanted somebody to manage the influx of internet users that we were getting. 
uh, on the forest at that time. So um, I'd go in because we had limited disk space. We'd have to run back end scripts to archive things and, you know, just make sure that things were running smoothly. So I was more of a, I felt like more of a caretaker, uh, which was completely fine because it was the endless forest. I revered all of my time on the endless forest. And if I could keep that flame going for even a little bit, uh, I was honored to do so. Do you know about how many regular participants you had at the time? Oh, um, we had a whole bunch of folks who came with us from the local area because for a while, um, when it was running at UNO, it had dial up as well as TCP connections. Um, and I went back and looked through Usenet archives and there were a few, uh, there were a few messages from either 91 or 92 that were asking, uh, if you dial in, please, please try to limit, uh, the amount of dial-ins you might be denied because we only have a limited number of connections for dial-in because it's a, a research machine. Um, so we had a whole bunch of folks come with us from Omaha and we got a large number of folks from uh, University of Michigan, Mount Holyoke University, some Missouri University. I'd say we were running upwards of 100, 150 fairly regular folks at uh, at any one time. Yeah, I mean, I, I might be overestimating the glow of history might be inflating the numbers, but there were a large number of, of users. Now, I, f I forget from my conversation with Dan, but this was still single user, one user at a time, correct? I believe so, yeah. So um, obviously some folks were, were logging in more than others, but um, I would say the interest in, because ISCA BBS uh, from Iowa State became big and folks were hungry for for maintaining that experience they had in the eighties as they went off to college. Uh, so they, they'd poke at least at the forest and um, we made, you know, a lot of the, the initial BBS lists. And so we were one of the first on the list. So yeah, but I believe it was still single user at a time. Yeah. So what were the final days? <laughs> what was the end of the endless forest? Like, Wow. Well, it, it lived at UNO for a while. And then um, I started, uh, when I started teaching at UNO in 1995, I also started working uh, because I was apparently a, some sort of superhuman being uh, full time at Novia Internetworking. And um, there was a point in, I believe, 95 or 96 when UNO was like, we can't do this anymore. So we moved over to Novia. Uh, and I think we lasted, because I was at Novia until 1997. I want to say we were there until 96 or 97, because I don't think I was running it once I left Novia. So it's probably lasted until 97. And... That was just, did numbers of users taper off or the interest taper off? Um, number of users was tapering a little bit because we were all in our mid-20s at that point. Um, there was also uh, some, we had a few users and, and one in particular who was um, making both Dan and myself a little unsettled uh, by their posts. And we had tried to have conversations with this user to no avail. And we just figured uh, they're getting incredibly disruptive. Traffic is down. Maybe this is the time, you know, instead of a seven season run, maybe we did an eight or nine season run when the minor characters of the sitcom aren't quite as great. Now's the time to pull the plug when we still have a little bit of dignity sure, before, sure. before things go wrong. Sure. So. So it sounds like your interest in tech ran in parallel with your participation on the BBS scene. You went off, went to college. I imagine you majored in computer science. That I did. Um, went to Creighton, majored in computer science there. Uh, got uh, a graduate assistantship, did most of a master's degree in computer science there before 
the Novia thing uh, came along in the UNO job. Uh, shout out to Matt Payne, who has changed all of our lives. Um, he was at UNO at the time and said, hey, there's an opening uh, for an instructor at a uh, position at UNO. I think you'd be great for it. And then did that from 95 on. So, yeah. Yeah, I've I've tried to get Matt on the show and he keeps throwing other people at me. So he <laughs> he's he's sacrificed you and Dan and probably probably be others, you know, following your interview here. And that's and that's Matt's way, right? Every mm-hmm. everybody before himself and yep. and for the better good. So, yep. So, uh what was tech life after after no more BBSs then? For Bob uh, well, it was it was mostly internet, uh, you know, stuff. Uh, when I was a, uh, when I took the graduate assistantship in 1993, um, I approached my uh, faculty advisor and said, um, you know, uh, I've been playing with this thing called Gopher, but there's this new thing uh, called the World Wide Web, and I think it would be great if we had a machine here. Uh, so that our students could log in, uh, like the Unix systems at um, UNO, and if we ran a, a like a website. Uh, so that was late '93 because I started in the fall of '93, and so he somehow procured money and got me a 486 DX uh, with some amount of disk drive space, and I downloaded the 97,000 floppy disks for Linux, you know, 1.0. And uh, got that <laughs> got that up and running somehow. And uh, so for me, I mean, it's it's been education from day one. Uh, since kindergarten, I've done nothing but education, right? Uh, but um, there in 93 with the web it's just starting up, um, I got a website up and running uh, in January of 1994. And if... If the statistics that I read are to be believed, there were about two or three thousand known websites at that point. And so I may not have been counted because we were just a little tiny departmental website and literary magazine that I was running off the website, all uh, off the server also. But uh, I'd like to think I was one of the first websites on the Internet. So, Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, and professionally, you're a teacher. I am, uh, and, and I assume ahead. you I assume you teach computer science. I I do teach computer science. Um, since day one uh, in 1995, I've taught intro to CS1 um, every semester and nearly every summer. So, how has that changed in 30 years? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I can talk about it in two different ways. Um, as uh, our language has changed, so I started teaching in Pascal. Uh, oh, sure. Did that, yeah, and I love Pascal. Oh my God! Yeah, it's just... Stan Stan Wildman and uh, gosh, I can't think of his partner in crime. They wrote a book on Pascal that I think was one of probably the best Pascal books I've ever read. Yeah, I, I... Uh, John Convolina, I believe. Yeah, John Convolina. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we lost Stan, uh, last December. He passed away. Oh, that's terrible. It is. He was, uh, he was a fantastic advocate for students, uh, and the ACM and everything. But, um, I, <laughs> uh, just to give Stan a, a little brief moment here. Um, when I interviewed at UNO, Stan and, uh, two other faculty interviewed me at five 30 on a, uh, uh, on a, like a Thursday afternoon, the week before classes started. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's when it wasn't bring somebody in for an entire day. And, and, you know, you've got to have 18,000 references. It was Matt Payne recommended you. Do you want to come in and talk to us for 90 minutes? You're hired. Um, and I will forever be grateful to Matt and Stan and the two Hashams who hired me uh, for, for bringing me on board, but I digress. Um Pascal and then uh, C++ for a little while. Um, well, C++ for maybe 10 years, Java for another 10 years or so. We made the change to Java 
because the AP test switched to Java. So we had students coming in who had taken AP Java and wanted credit. And we said, okay, I guess we need to change to Java. And then here in the past uh, three years, we've switched to Python finally, um, which has been a great boon. I was a huge fan of Perl uh, as a scripting language. And um, I was a, I was kind of against Python for whatever reason, but now that we've made the switch, uh, students take to it far more readily. They can write something without all of the syntactical sugar and the overhead of creating an entire class just to, just to write a, you know, hello world program. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I've gone from transparencies with code <laughs> to, um, you know, we're doing interactive polling in class. So, sure. so how many years, <laughs> how, how much control do you have over the content of your curriculum? Uh, I am the coordinator uh, for our intro course. So um, it makes it sound like I'm some sort of uh, uh, control freak, but I'm not. I'm just, I'm in charge of our uh, faculty uh, teaching the course of the graduate assistants and the undergraduate graduate assistants teaching the recitations. Um, and I've been doing that for 15, 20 years now of the, of my 30 year education career. So um it's great uh, bringing students into the teaching fold because I've had some of, over the years, the undergrads and the grad students, especially the grad students go on for professional teaching at a university, but we're like, yeah, I think I want to be a teacher. It's like, I think you would be a great teacher. That's great. What uh, challenges has the new AI large language model craze caused <laughs> for the, for academia? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Do we need to pause here while you catch your breath? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, it is the, um, as one of my colleagues puts it, um, this is as big as, um, oh, now I can't remember how he puts it. Oh my gosh. He's a huge fan of AI and large language models. Um, we have other faculty who are uh, almost running in the opposite direction, saying that we need to go back to punch cards uh, so that <laughs> students can't cheat. No, I, um, I've, I've I've done that. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you do not. <laughs> no, absolutely right. Um, it's it's trying to find a balance for AI in the curriculum is tough. And it varies from discipline to, to discipline. Um, in an intro to CS1 course, um, any of the assignments that we can come up with can be solved by ChatGPT or Copilot or Bard, Nay, whatever its new name is. Um, so I try to demonstrate to my students right now um, Hey, look, I just had this interaction with ChatGPT where it tried to tell me that 60 plus 40 was 90. And I had to walk through, I had to back up seven steps to have ChatGPT figure out that no, 60 plus 40 is actually 100. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah today, it, today it had issues with February 29th. It, oh, sure. It claimed it was only the 29th during a leap year, and this was not a leap year. So it uh, <laughs> some some people who actually have some sort of a product that uses this with day calculations ran into the problem. It's, and it, it, it just depends there. It's slowly coming out of it, but uh, it was interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. It's how do I talk about students in a positive way here? Um, you have to hope for the best. You have to hope that the students who are taking these classes aren't just checking a box, but there are students who are just checking a box. And um, because, I mean, it's not going to go away. AI is not going to go away as we know it. It's just going to get better. Um, in our, because I also teach an intro to web development class. I teach the intro to CS class, CS1 class. I teach a, a mid-level web development class. 
we have to figure out how to have our students understand that they need to understand the content that's coming back from ChatGPT so that they are critical consumers of the content. Because I, I'm i a fan of ChatGPT and, and AI. It is a great place to bounce an idea. It's a great place to say, hey, I want to write a program that does this. Can you, can you, you know, uh, generate a skeleton for me? Um, but students don't understand that. They just want the grade. And so I've got students who are struggling with learning. We're on selection and loops right now, uh, this semester. I've got students who are struggling with, with it. And then I've got students who are just copying and pasting into chat GPT and it just all, it all has to fall out somehow. Right. Um, I, I assume this was a problem with stack exchange and the code golf sites and all that sort of thing that predated. They just, the, what the internet allowed for people to collaborate on things like that, that there was, there were still issues with, uh, you know, people not going through and doing their own work. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Stack, uh, sites like stack exchange, Chegg, um, the <laughs> if I want to look back fondly now on the Stack Exchange and Chegg days, at least we could then go to the site, pull the code down, plug it into our plagiarism detection software <laughs> and similarity software and go, does anybody's software look like this software? Now with generative AI, you know, even chat GPT may generate slightly different solutions for each student. And it's it's a lot tougher to to find who's cheating and that's the thing is we don't want to spend our time trying to police our students we want them to be learning and we have better things to do than policing them but um yeah i almost look back on the good old days of just static sites uh fondly now because it was a lot easier to find <laughs> so what's what's next on the horizon for bob fulkerson What's next? Um, well, I've got two kids in college, a third kid on the way here shortly. Um, I'll be hitting my 30 year mark at UNO with no plans on stopping. Um, I love getting these students excited about code. Um, I mean, if I could have students, uh, for those of you listening, I'm holding up the, the BBS <laughs> software again. <laughs> For if I could have students who find stuff that they wrote 10, 15, 20 years later and be excited by, ah, oh, that's where I started everything. That's, that's the goal. So um, maybe taking some trips. I don't know. That'd be kind of nice. My wife teaches at Metro. So we're both constantly teaching. Um, so we just have to make time to, to do some trips and, and stuff, but uh, yeah, sure. that's what's next is more of the same. I think. Is there anything we didn't cover that we should have? I don't think so. Um, what what was I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the tables on you for a second. What what were some of your first experiences with bulletin boards and and tech? So um, I had I'd had a TRS eighty when I was seventeen in uh, nineteen eighty three, mm -hmm. and uh, I did some work at high school. I was in some in independent study programming courses, and one of my instructors introduced me to a Commodore 64. She, she had pets in her chem lab and she was my sponsor for this independent study. She got a 64. Well, I immediately fell in love with it. So when I graduated, I bought one. And, uh, about three months later, as my first year of tech school was starting, a buddy of mine called me. He had a Commodore 64. He and I hadn't talked for a while. We talked, he went out and bought one. He had a Texas Instruments computer. He bought a Commodore 64. He called me and said, hey, I was at Sears and I bought one of these modem things. Can you go get one and we can talk? And so I ran down to Sears and Council Bluffs and bought, spent $60 on a Vic modem and popped it in. And you you know all too well, I I was using a dial, a rotary dial phone. So oh, you, man. If you remember this modem, you'd have to dial listen for a tone, unplug the handset, plug it into the modem. It, yep. it it didn't have, you know, automatic phone features in it. So we did that. We were typing at each other, but we couldn't see what each other was saying because we <laughs> didn't have a true chat mode. When line noise would hit, it would change the colors because 
the terminal software didn't filter out any of the color changing characters. So I, I told my friend, I said, you know what, I've, I've got a magazine here that has an Omaha bulletin board system listed in it. I thought that was pretty cool that we have one BBS in the Omaha area. And uh, I think it was in creative computing. And I can't, I can't prove that. I can't find the issue. Right. But uh, it was a uh, split infinity, a, an Apple board. And yes. uh, was that one of yours? Yes. Yes. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I, we each called it up and we got on. And if you remember in the menus on every BBS, almost all of them on the primary menu had an option for, BBS lists in the Omaha area or other BBS systems or, you know, the, the character varied, but I was just aghast. Wow. There might be a couple more. And I right. clicked the other BBSs and there's this huge list scrolled by and, you know, our terminal software didn't have any capture buffers or anything like that. Yeah. So we had to manually start to make, you know, lists. I was a little familiar with, was it control S control Q to mm -hmm. do the, do the ASCII X on X off. I was familiar with doing that on an Apple, so I tried it and it worked. So I was able to, well, and at 300 baud, it, it, you know, it wasn't like it was going to scroll off terribly fast. But my friend and I then began to divide and conquer. We we called each other up. When we were first talking, my dad came downstairs because I had, I had told him at dinner what, uh, you know, what I had just bought. And he came down he, and uh, John and I are typing at each other. And his his question was, why don't you just call him? And so, <laughs> I, oh, you don't understand, Dad. Yeah, you don't understand. <laughs> so we we started uh, making our ways through these bulletin board systems, and that's when we found uh, we sort of we well, there were a few that uh, I touched on a number of them. The forest was not one that I that I used to hit very regularly. Um, I uh, somehow was fascinated with the the cracking zone, which was a Commodore sixty four pirate board. Mm -hmm. the the sysop was a 17 year old kid and uh he's gone on to do some amazing work uh he had worked for sun uh he was actually part of the java wallet project and a bunch of that that sort of thing uh i've i i'd like to see if i could get him on the show sometime he uh, i was sitting around reading a computes gazette in the mid 80s and i saw his bulletin board system the software advertised Okay. And on like a like a third sized ad from Starpoint Software, I saw the Xavian BBS. I called him up and I said, "Did you, what what was going on here?" And he says, "Yeah, I didn't know they were going to do that, but yeah, he's been he'd been working out a deal, and I don't think they ever paid him, but it was still yeah. cool to uh, see that Sanctuary yeah. was one of my favorite ones. It it had no file transfer or anything like that, but." It was just uh, that was probably the first board that I would refer to as social media. People yeah. would get on, and while sometimes they would talk tech, it really wasn't about what computer somebody was using or anything like that. It was just everybody kind of would would chat. It was a, it was more about pop culture than it was tech, and it was a lot of fun. And the board was snappy. Um, yep. Bruce and Tom were a couple of the guys. The sysops behind that were a couple of the first guys that made their way over to my parents' house to say hello. Um, there were the Commodore 64 users group. We I got on that board, and John Stevenson, uh, American Flyer, was the author and sysop of that board. I, I was just fascinated with a lot of these boards where the uh, sysops were also the authors of the software, and I, I think sure. that's something that got lost as we as we went into the 90s these systems were just these people were just buying canned systems that while you yep. could you could customize them a bit but they just they didn't have that flavor you know to the equivalent of a mom and pop store versus a you know a, a chain store it, it just, they just didn't have the same same charm right um, no i know what you're talking about yeah um one of my favorites was drbbs run by jack winslade and uh uh Jack has just done, he, he, he's just quietly done so many innovative things regarding tech. He, he got uh, some things running for FidoNet on 64K machines that should never have been able to run. And uh, he, you know, he just, I think he was known for it by the handful of people at the time, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know that he's gotten the recognition that he, that he deserved for that. He, he went to DEFCON last summer and I think they were going to try to hook up 
one of his old CPM systems to the internet. And so <laughs> I don't, I don't think that went perfectly. So I'm, I'm curious if he's going to try to do that again uh, right. sometime. So I, uh, I had gotten a Commodore 128, then an Amiga 500. And then for a little while, I didn't have a computer at home. I, I uh, was working uh, programming mainframes was my first, first job. And uh, I remember buying a VIC-20 with a VIC modem after that progression of all these advanced computers, just sure. so that I could dial back into the BBS scene. And it, it wasn't, you know, it was starting to wane a little bit. Um, I got an MS-DOS machine. And uh, I, when I bought my Amiga, I had actually gotten an Amiga modem and I kept the, kept the Amiga modem because uh, it was 1200 baud. And I didn't have a 1200 yep. baud before that. Or, I guess I did. I had a no name 1200 baud for the 128 that was not, it didn't use Hayes commands. So I had to disassemble the terminal to figure out how to incorporate my software with it. Right. Uh, uh, but I uh, got an MS DOS machine, a bunch of MS DOS boards started to pop up around town and that sort of to take started to take over the landscape a bit um i coded on the mainframe for a couple of years but my real love was ms dos c and microcomputer assembly language i went uh same company and i i went into coding in that sort of thing and i just sort of followed the progression of curly brace languages at that point <laughs> and uh uh I was on some bulletin boards in the early nineties and by that time they had evolved to use quick mail uh, so that okay. I could, I could log in, download my quick mail packets from all these different places, go through and at my leisure, then offline read and respond to messages that, you know, uh, there had been such a, such an evolution since I was really heavily active before, but then in pretty short order, uh, I got my monthly CompuServe disc and it came with a program called Trumpet Winsock. Yep. And uh CompuServe uh you could you could run a, this special version of Trumpet Winsock, log into CompuServe and at the terminal prompt type go slip. I believe it was slip yeah. serial line serial line interface protocol. Yep. And then I then I hit my first my my first websites and then uh I did some early consulting then on the web and uh, I actually wrote one of the first articles in print on CGI programming. And I say one of, because in the same issue, this was in Dr. Dobbs journal in the same issue, there was a, uh, there was a woman who also wrote a CGI uh, article. Hers <laughs> appears before mine. So technically, <laughs> technically I was not the first hers was about 10 pages before mine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That, that that's <laughs> that's um, hilarious. I so so for a while you you say you're a big fan of Pearl. I was uh, Pearl in those early days of the internet was indispensable. I mean, absolutely, it was, it was just great. And uh, I uh, took second place. Uh, I don't know if you ever read the Pearl Journal, the the oh, publication yeah. at the time. So yeah. they would have these obfuscated Pearl contests, and a, a buddy of mine would say, "Aren't they all obfuscated?" And uh, <laughs> I, I took second place in one of those with a Perl program that the category was to print the words, the Perl journal. And I, uh, I built a little state machine that would do it and it would read out, read certain things out of the comments at the top. So if they put it, if they put it through a beautifier, which would prune the comments, right. the thing, thing wouldn't run. So they were having trouble. So, so I took second place. That is now, in an, an O'Reilly book called Games, Diversions, and Pearl Culture, where they've they've captured together all of those uh, all of those uh, articles from or most of them from uh, the Pearl Journal, and I I did an edit on um, I did an edit on a book by Scott McMahon that was uh, on Pearl for Windows. Uh, I had been writing some articles for Windows Developers Journal and the C Users Journal, and they wanted to get me to write a book. And I started to write a tech book, and for one reason or another, I wasn't able to. They changed that and asked if I could edit this Pearl book, and uh, I I did, and it it just turned out to be not the greatest book, uh, but it was kind of cool because uh, Randall Schwartz, who at the time was a big time Pearl guy, 
who yeah. later later became a big time small talk guy, and now he's a big time flutter guy. Yeah, um, he uh, he actually had him do a, a tech review of it as well. So if you look in the in the uh, thank yous page, there's my name right next to Randall Schwartz's. So Damn. Oh, and, and I I emailed him once in the mid '90s, and I had never seen the I had never seen an auto responder. So I emailed him and basically he was on vacation and I got a message that says, Hey, I'm going to be on vacation, blah, blah, blah. I thought that was the coolest thing. Absolutely. <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, Randall Schwartz came to UNO. I don't remember why, cause I didn't bring him. Uh, and he gave a talk on small talk, um, yeah, at the dynamic languages users group. Well, maybe. Yeah. Okay. This would have maybe, been maybe we were at UNO 10, at that point ten years ago. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm trying to remember it. So, the name of that group has changed, and I think the I think the uh, for a while they were meeting out at the facility out at Exarbon, the where the uh, you know computers. Are. I don't know if that's where you work work yep, at now. Yep. Okay, Peter Kiewit Institute. Yep. Yep. Um, that's uh, that's where it moved. I'm trying to remember. I think it was, I think it might've been on campus. And I think, um, I think he was probably at UNO to talk to students and found out about the meeting somehow that night of the DLUG. And of course, that's the one meeting I miss. <laughs> oh, I was so pumped. I was so excited to get to, to meet the guy, uh, you know, the Randall Schwartz in person. Um, and then he didn't talk about Pearl at all. And I was like, oh, come on. Are you no, kidding he, me? He, he had moved on. He, yeah, he, he's an interesting fellow. I think he was the one, I think, who also got into some hot water at Intel when he was consulting so. there. Yeah, he, uh, I, re I recall something about that. It, yeah. uh, they, they don't really take kindly to vulnerability disclosure. And uh, he had, no. he had run a scan and I think he was looking to uh, extend his gig. And, you know, that, that, uh, that was probably not a good time. So no. I don't know if he associated that with Pearl or not, but oh, could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I taught my, my web development speaking of Pearl and uh, games. What's, what's the name of the book again? Games, diversions and yeah. Games, diversions and Pearl culture. Right. Yeah. That's on my desk uh, by the way. So you're <laughs> on my desk uh, at work. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to tell you which page. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I taught the the sophomore level web development class in Perl through last year. Oh wow! Um, so I I did CGI through because uh, I started that class in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that was that was prime. Perl is the the you know top of the mountain uh, for it, for web programming. It is, and it, I'm sorry, it was, but um having done some consulting in those early days for Pearl, you could never be exactly sure what kind of a Pearl environment you were getting into. And, yeah. you know, they might have Pearl four or Pearl five. They might have the looming object extensions. They might or may or may not have a database. You might have to put things in slash CGI dash bin. Yep. Uh, you might have to put the extension dot PL. You might have to put the extension dot CGI. Um, the uh, hash bang at the top might have to change if the Perl interpreter location was elsewhere. I, I one thing I had never run across though I had heard of it was the uh, mod Perl for Apache that was really probably the sensible thing to use instead of running a new process every time you wanted to process a form. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I went through all the iterations <laughs> to, to get my students the most quote unquote modern, um, version of what they were learning up through last year, including mod Pearl. Uh, and then up through last year, uh, with, um, uh, when I was teaching them, uh, Mojolicious as the MVC framework. Um, but now that we've got all of our, all of our students doing Python, it's like, okay, I need to switch to Python and we'll do flask and, We'll talk about, you know, putting uh, G Unicorn and a couple of things. We'll we'll do Nginx for the web server, and we'll talk about that stuff. But you know, the interesting the interesting thing is, with out of box Python, there is a uh, the web server class can actually run CGI bins. 
So you can run a Python script that starts up a CGI bin ready web, web server that then calls another Python script that there's a CGI library for Python and you can still do CGI's right out of the box, no flask required. Nice. I guess I was not aware of that. I, I just went straight to flask for, uh, which, which is the more efficient way. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I I would throw some regular express. It was a it's still called programming on the internet, which back in 1998 was a really, you know, uh, selling point for students. Oh, programming on the internet. Whoa! Oh, now well, in 2024, they're like, "What does programming on the internet mean?" <laughs> yep. 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 Um, but uh, I will have students who have come. I've had students who have come back to me because I have a whole section in the class about regular expressions because they don't see them anywhere else and mm -hmm. Perl was the the gold standard for regular expression processing mm -hmm. um and i will i've had students stop me and go hey bob thank you so much for the regular expression stuff i use it every day at work and it's like thank pearl wow that's great <laughs> that's so, great well um, bob this has been a lot of fun yeah absolutely thanks again I, for having me on and i appreciate and, you being on all right great so Thank you much. Uh, we'll talk to you again. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Let's do this again soon. Take care.